Um, now we're going to look at example 8.71 from the book, which is an example of a Poincaré map. And the example is for this 2D flow, r dot equals r times 1 minus r squared, theta dot equals 1. This is a flow that has a fixed point at r equals 0 and a limit cycle at r equals 1. And um, the limit cycle is stable and the fixed point is unstable. And um, our angular uh, velocity is always just 1, so everything is marching steadily um, in the, oh, this is the counterclockwise direction. Let's set um, sigma to just be the positive x-axis. Um, so it's the set of points uh, x comma 0, such that um, x an element of r and x is greater than 0. That's the set of points um, that make up the line segment sigma. So um, here we are, and here's sigma, and we know that if we start at a point, um, we return to sigma after we've gone uh, 2 pi in theta, and it takes us um, 2 pi in theta takes time 2 pi in this system, and so our change in r is... Um, whatever the change is over time 2 pi. And so we can integrate forward by time 2 pi to return, to start at sigma and return to sigma, and learn what r is doing um, in our Poincaré map. So um, the first thing to try is maybe just literally integrate forward by 2 pi and learn how much r has changed in that time. Um, that's not going to work, and we can set up the integral to see why. Okay, uh, here's the integral. It's the integral from 0 to 2 pi. Those are time bounds of r minus r cubed. These are functions that depend on time that we need to integrate dt. Uh, we don't know what these functions are. Um, we can't do this integral. We need a dr here, uh, not a dt. So we need a new idea for how to do this. Um, this is a trick we've used other times. Um, we could integrate dt over dr with respect to dr. And um, that gives us uh, an integral, really, that gives us a time. And we know that the title, total time that we want is 2 pi. And so we integrate from the beginning r to the final r, uh, dt dr dr. And that's giving us the total time it took us to go around, which we know is 2 pi. And when we plug in for dt dr, that's going to be 1 over dr dt. It's going to be something that just has r's in it, and this is an integral we're going to be able to do. Okay, uh, here's the integral that we want to do. Um, the integral from wherever we're starting on sigma to wherever we're returning to sigma of um, 1 over dr dt dr. Because we set sigma up to coincide with the x-axis, we're in a pretty special case where actually our starting radius is just the x value that we're starting at, and our ending radius is wherever that x is mapped to under our Poincaré map. So here's the complete setup. 2 pi, the amount of time it takes, is equal to the integral from x, our starting point, to p of x, wherever we go under the Poincaré map, of um, 1 over um, d, dr dt dr. And to integrate this, uh, okay, this is like a single variable integration problem, and um, we need to use the method of partial fractions. And actually, I'm going to go ahead and, and do it out just as a review of that method. First, um, we factor our polynomial, and it factors into 1 over r times 1 over 1 plus r times 1 over uh, 1 minus r. I guess I mean we factor our denominator. And then we're going to rewrite this as a sum of fractions. So we want to break this apart into a sum of fractions, and we just don't know what the numerators are. And um, we multiply through to give everything a common denominator, and we know that um, our new denominator on the left-hand side needs to be equal to 1. And to find values, we're just going to plug in um, r equals 0, and that'll tell us about a, r equals 1 to learn about c, and r equals negative 1 to learn about b. So plugging in r equals 0, I learned a is 1. Plugging in r equals 1, I learned 2c is 1. And plugging in r is negative 1, I learned negative 2b is 1. Integrating, um, we get a bunch of, of logarithms, um, and we're going to have to plug in our two endpoints, and this will be equal to 2 pi, and we're hoping it all simplifies nicely as we work towards finding out what our Poincaré map is. Uh, multiplying through by 2, 
and then um, applying the exponential to both sides, um, we get this complex fraction, which we're going to work to continue to simplify. Uh, bringing all of the components that have an x in them to one side and leaving the p's on the other side, and then multiplying through and bringing everything with a factor of p squared to one side, uh, we're left with this expression, which we're going to be able to simplify to find p. Uh, with further manipulation, uh, we make it to this expression, that p is equal to whatever this is, and this is an explicit map for p of x uh, given x. So if we're given the x value of a point along, um, along sigma, which has been defined as that curve on the x-axis, and um, we integrate forward in time to learn where it returns, p of x is our return point. We can use this map both to do a little bit of analytic analysis and um, also to do um, a qualitative analysis of what's happening in this picture. So here's the map. X is mapped um, to P of X. I've just drawn in the line um, X, X equals Y or X equals, uh, sorry, Y equals X uh, into this curve. And the way I want to use this is let's say I give you an initial condition for X. And then um, we know that that X is being mapped to this P of X. Well, that value of P of X is identical to the value of X corresponding to this location on the green line. And um, the reason for that is that this is the line where the, the, these two directions, the width and the height, are equal. So um, it had this height, and that is this value of x. Um, and so this was um, x, and this uh, is p of x. And um, if we map this again, we have just learned uh, the location of p of p of x, which we tend to denote um, p2, p squared of x. Um, and of course we can run it again. This is uh, the x location of p3 of x. And um, this, is, this is called a cobweb diagram, uh, I guess because of how this looks. But as we do this, I hope it's clear that we're watching what happens as we iterate the map. And so when we go once around our orbit, this particular point gets closer to some point, and then as we do it again, even closer, and as we do it again, even closer. And that particular point is this one right here. This is a point where, um, where P of X and X are equal to each other. And so this is actually a limit cycle. It's a fixed point of the system. And this behavior that we're going towards the limit cycle as we iterate our Poincaré map that is the behavior associated with a stable limit cycle. So uh, let's see, what's important here, we drew this curve, we drew this y equals x line, the intersection gave us the fixed point of the p of x uh, map, and that told us that there's a limit cycle associated with this Poincaré map. And then we were able to, were able to do this cobwebbing to tell us whether this uh, limit cycle is a stable one or an unstable one. And um, we can see, I can do the cobwebbing from the other side, uh, too. I go here, uh, that's this x, uh, that brings me here. Uh, we can see that from both directions, um, from both directions, it's stable. Uh, so this is a stable limit cycle. For the analytic approach, uh, we're interested in zooming in right near where x star equals 1, because that was the radius of the limit cycle in our original system. One option um, to figure out uh, what's happening with this map near this fixed point would be to use a Taylor expansion of this map about the point x star equals 1. However, to be honest, uh, that looks kind of stressful. I don't really want to take this derivative. Of course we can, but it's hard to feel enthusiastic about it. And so um, we actually have another option, and that option is to say, oh, we know we're like really close to the fixed point, and so why don't we just um, approximate what our dot is doing when we're there and then derive an approximate Poincaré map for when we're really close to the fixed point. So um, we have to recall that x 
uh, on sigma is actually really r. And we have this equation for r dot. And so this is r. And so r dot is basically equal to eta dot. I mean, it's exactly equal to eta dot. And we know that r dot was given by our original equation. And so we can substitute in and drop all of the higher order and eta terms because we know eta is quite small. And eta dot is thus just approximately equal to negative 2 eta. And now we, we know that we're going to be going around for time 2 pi. So we can just integrate the system for time 2 pi. This one is going to be actually possible to integrate and see, um, see what happens over that time. Okay, so of course, um, we just have an exponential. Eta as a function of time is its initial times e to the negative 2t. And we said that we're going for time 2 pi to get all the way around. So we have a factor of e to the negative 4 pi on our original eta. And so um, we start, so here we are, uh, there's um, sigma and there's x star at 1. And we're starting at some perturbation a little bit away, a distance um, eta naught away. And we were asking the question earlier, um, it, does this grow over one period or does this shrink over one period. And we had said that we need to check the Floquet multipliers, the characteristic multipliers of the system, and they tell us whether it grows or shrinks. And so um, this is that Floquet multiplier, that characteristic multiplier, and it is e to the negative 4 pi. And so the question we need to ask is, is the magnitude of e to the negative 4 pi larger than 1 or smaller than 1? If it's smaller than 1, then when we return, we're going to be even closer to our fixed point than when we left. And if it's bigger than 1, we're going to be even further away. Um, e to the negative 4 pi is less than 1. And this is consistent with the other, other information that we had from our pictorial approach that the limit cycle is stable.